Go on, I'd like to know comedian Jeff Norcott with us in a few moments. Time plus this. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. Alas, and all of that. Here we go again, theatre bosses who've added a warning before a performance of Julius Caesar telling delicate theatre-goers that the play might be disturbing because it contains knives and violence. How has Shakespeare managed to survive all of these years since that play was first performed in... 1599. Yeah. More on that as well. Everything you need to know, all the breaking news right here on Talk TV, 0344 499 1000. And we welcome back onto the television and radio stage, Jeff Norcott is with us. Comedian, writer and all-round nice bloke. How are you, Jeff? Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm not too bad, actually. I just, that story about the Shakespeare play with a trigger warning. <laughs> I think I think they should all come with trigger warnings. Romeo and Juliet contains really annoying 14-year-old boy who writes bad poetry. <laughs> Let's just get, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? To the point where you think, are they, they must be conscious that maybe it's part of the drive to sell tickets, I don't know. But the idea that people wouldn't go to a, a piece of Renaissance drama and expect a bit of violence seems a bit far-fetched. It's a bit strange, isn't it? And also, I do wonder, just on that point, Jeff, whether it's now become... Because anyone that, that, that would... Presumably there's a meeting takes place at the, you know, the mm. RSC or wherever it happens, or the Globe or wherever, where they go, right, OK, you know, there's, there's a lot of violence in this. We should maybe put out a caveat and a, and a warning. And they must know that they're going to get absolutely roasted by well, people like us when, when this happens. Well, so do they do it on... Do they do this to annoy people like us? I don't know. I think that there is a culture in meetings at the moment. If someone suggests something that seems kind, hashtag be kind on the face of it, everyone else is scared to shoot it down. So someone will say something, go like, yeah, I just, I just think there's a lot of violence. Maybe we should give people a heads up. And all the kind of probably dinosaurs there that are worried about early retirement will go, oh, yeah, very good idea, Gavin. Let's absolutely put warnings of things that are obviously going to happen that probably one in 10,000 people would be perturbed by. So I think there's probably at the moment a corporate culture of people making uh, accommodations for things that most people would find bizarre. But once you yeah. get in that world of, you know, where, where there's an HR department, where there's company lawyers, I think people probably do anything for a quiet life. Yeah, and we've seen it with books as well, haven't we? Uh, university mm -hmm. libraries that are now putting trigger warnings on things like Harry Potter. Yeah, and also my, one of my favourite ones is uh, on Disney Plus at the moment. The original Star Wars has a trigger warning that says contains tobacco depictions. And you're like, seriously? They also, yeah, genuinely, and and they also blow up a planet, a whole planet. Yeah. It's the same. It's the exact. It's the exact same warning on uh, 101 Dalmatians because obviously Cruella Deville smokes a lot. So there's a warning about the smoking, but wow. not about the fact that she wants to murder dogs. Yeah, nothing about the dog culling, nothing about yeah. Armageddon, <laughs> but, you know, somebody <laughs> might have a sneaky sig halfway through. Yeah. Uh, that is extraordinary. But we, we kind of live in strange times. I'm always intrigued, and I think we talked about this last time, Jeff, uh, in, in your job, of mm. how... No, you know, the, the whole Ricky Gervais thing yesterday, you'd have seen his new Netflix show, mm. obviously came in for some stick and also mm. some support simultaneously. Um, and I guess you get that as well. I know Jimmy Carr, another one of your colleagues, gets you know that because... And all, all of the, the, the three I've quoted, yourself included, you're all different kinds of, of writers and comedians, but there does now seem to be... Like never before, really. I mean, I'm pretty sure even Bernard Manning didn't get the kind of jip that comedians are getting today. Well, I, I do think that there's a fundamental difference. And the first thing about the Ricky Gervais thing is, is this is a really old-fashioned take, but I haven't actually watched the whole show yet, so I can't have a view on it. Because that is the point about these specials, which increasingly, they land on Netflix... And what happens is that a, a short clip will get taken out, yeah. whether it's David Chappelle or Jimmy Carr. And, and the, the context of a live show is either that you sit and watch the whole thing uh, live or, or that you watch the whole thing um, at home. And I think what's changed dramatically, I mean, you mentioned Bernard Manning there, who a lot of people would have found, you know, uh, his material offensive, definitely now a lot, even at the time. But that he wasn't doing that stuff on mainstream television, if you know what I mean. And yeah, I think yeah. that there is... There, the big difference now is that there's a high degree 
I, look, first up, people are entitled to be offended. Of course, I think even Ricky Gervais would say people are allowed to be offended. The big thing is, do you get to then call for that material to be edited or even removed? Because it's there as a selection. People select to watch yep. Netflix. They select to watch these shows. And I think that, in a way, this discourse around offensiveness has been slow to catch up with the fact that this is very different. I mean, if Ricky Gervais went on uh, Saturday night at the Palladium and said this, people go, well, OK, that's quite a strong flavour for this show. But it's not. It, it's in the context of being something you have yeah, to yeah. choose to watch. And I think people need to acknowledge that. I, I guess one of the issues, um, and, and I understand this, but I don't think it would be an argument to stop it. Uh, I saw some people, so, some trans people on, on Twitter saying, look, what happens here? Because obviously a lot of the newspapers mm. picked up on the, the trans stuff and some people said, you know, breath of fresh air that Ricky Gervais can go there where lots of people are saying you can't and other people saying it's transphobic, etc. But one of the arguments that is, it's certainly a seductive one, is that actually what it does do, people who want to be horrible will kind of use that as a good excuse, a big fat green, like Ricky Gervais can do it, so I can start saying horrible words to transsexual people. Well, I mean, I can't speak for how people take, yeah. you know, what they take away from that show. I'm sensitive to the fact that the way that the trans debate has been inflated by the culture war, it has put a lot of pressure on trans people. I absolutely think that that uh, is a reality. But equally, you know, in, in the early sort of stages of this debate where the principle of self-identification sort of ran on quite far ahead of where the public were at, I think, and certain yep. uh, sort of uh, sex-based identities were kind of seeming to be erased. I think what we're seeing now is maybe a correction back against that, you know, and, and it can, can be quite uh, strong in some areas. But I think the point is, is that Ricky Gervais evidently uh, uh, thinks that, that the principle of self-identification and, and the fact that, you know, someone could be seen as a woman while still having a penis is something he finds hard to grapple with. And that's what stand-up comedy does, is you find something that doesn't make sense to you, yeah. essentially, and you explore that uh, through comedy. And like I say, if, if this was like a, a, a BBC One primetime special, I think it would be a slightly different discussion, but it's something that people go to. And it's also, is it fair to say, Jeff, that it's, it's also about where where comedy comes from does it does it is it mm. coming from a place of hatred is it coming from a place of deliberate volatility and and, and in order to provoke um, an upset and of course i think with gervais and and, and most comedians it, it isn't coming from that place and and that's that's kind of relevant too isn't it i i don't i mean i don't think so and i mean as i say i haven't watched the whole special but i've already seen another clip later on in the special where he, he makes a slightly different point so so i'd be very surprised if somebody like ricky gervais really wished harm uh, uh on the trans community yeah, uh, yeah I, ju I just don't think that that is a reality but comedy has is and has always been the the place where difficult ideas can get tested out what, you know you could like i say i always say don't people that are upset absolutely entitled to be upset that's not for the comic to decide but what what i, I don't think as i said before is that people should be sort of maneuvering to get things edited uh, or removed because of because of how it affects their sensibilities yeah totally um just before we break jeff this is uh in front of us here this is the sue gray report look at that yeah. beauty 37 pages of gripping shelf breaker right there yes. in my hand um i mean what do we is that it now is, have we drawn a line under this thing it's a question we've been asking our listeners this afternoon I don't know. I mean, I, I, th I think you, we all call her Sue now, as Boris kept on just saying. So, I mean, so, there's one thing you don't want to do is give the impression that it's been a bit matey, is keep going. Yeah, as, as I said to Sue the other day, actually, who's a couple of, not, not beers, but, you know, as I call her, Sue G these days. I mean, look, I, I said at the time when it originally broke, I thought that I, th I did think that he'd misled the house um, and I did think that he should have resigned. But... Um, but I do think that this didn't... It felt like a, a sort of another movement of the same kind of orchestra, didn't it? It was, it was the same sort of speeches. It didn't feel like it moved the dial on much. But I think, like, the what the findings about the treatment of cleaning staff was, was disgusting. But, but I think what will happen is he'll keep his job. But I also think what will happen is there's so many people now that would never vote Conservative while Boris is still there, or, or rather there's enough people that will make it very hard for them to win a majority of the next election. Yeah, I, I think that is that is the real danger, isn't it? Not they, they might mm. win, but will it be a majority, etc.?